بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله we're in the first week of Ramadan and I got the news today that our dear brother Imam Suhaib Sultan passed away so I just want inshallah if everybody could pray for him and for his family. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him a high place in Jannah. It's it's a sign, I think, of Kabul, inshallah, that he was accepted with Allah to die on the day of Jum'ah in the first week of Ramadan, which is a time of immense blessing and rahmah. And I know he was well loved. I had visited him when he, at Princeton. He invited me for an event and he was just a beautiful person, a very hospitable host. I mean, you hear this about people sometimes, but with him genuinely, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that he really was a just a very beautiful soul, and people who knew him, I think, recognize that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and make it easy for his family. I know he left behind a wife and um, uh, and and a dependent, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make, make that uh, easy for them, inshallah. Ramadan is a, a, an immense blessing for this community. I think everybody feels a kind of excitement when Ramadan comes and and despite all of the difficulties and tribulations that happen around the world, there's just a great blessing in the the, the time that we're in in the month when it comes on us. But one of the most important aspects of this month is it's a month of the Qur'an. It's a month when we really are supposed to go back to the Qur'an and to to become intimate with the Qur'an. I hope, inshallah, I'm going to be looking at uh, Imam Al-Ghazali's extraordinary work called Johar al-Qur'an, which are the essences or the jewels of the Qur'an. Uh, and he, I think just had incredible insights that were clearly openings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is true of many of our great scholars. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Qamar, the text message I wanted to look at today in Surah Al-Qamar, is the 17th verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ That we have made this Qur'an we facilitated this Qur'an as a reminder. And is there anyone that uh, will really take this to heart, uh, that will internalize uh, that fact? And it's, it's a rhetorical question, but it's an important question that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is posing to us because I think one of the things that we tend to forget is that this is an open invitation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the, the deen, the transaction with Allah is an open transaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's asking us, فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرْ That in this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that he's facilitated the Qur'an. And he's facilitated in a lot of different ways. One is in tilawa. Well, one of the most extraordinary things... if he, if you notice that learning foreign languages is very difficult for people, but generally people can actually recite the Qur'an, you'll find people from Pakistan or from India who speak Arabic with a real uh, strong accent, but when they recite the Qur'an, they can recite the Qur'an as good as the Arabs. And so there's a type of facilitation just in the 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 reading of the Qur'an, which is quite extraordinary, that people can learn how to read the Qur'an properly. I mean, obviously some people do have difficulties with some of the letters because Arabic has unusual letters that aren't found in a lot of languages like the Ain and the Qaf and the Ta and the Va and the, and the La. There's a, actually a book one of the scholars wrote on the difference between Laud and La because uh, people tend to conflate those for, that are non-Arab, even some of the Arabs do that. But the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has facilitated the learning of, uh, of the Qur'an, the tilawa of the Qur'an. But also he's facilitated the mem memorization of the Qur'an, the hawf of Qur'an. And this is why children can memorize the Qur'an. If you give a child something like 
the Constitution of the United States, and they'll really struggle to memorize it. They can do it, but they'll struggle. Whereas if you give them a page of the Quran, it's quite stunning how quickly people can memorize uh, a good portion of the Quran. But he's also made it relatively easy to understand. It's not a difficult book. It has multiple dimensions, but at one level, the Quran is is written in a very, very unusual language. It's a completely, it's unique in its in its presentation. There's no Arabic like it before or after. And Arabs, even Christian Arabs, they know when the Quran is being recited. If you recite a verse of Quran, generally people will, will can identify it, even if they're not that educated. They can identify it as, as the Quran. The, the difference between the Hadith and between the Quran is stunning. Because given that they both come from the same source, the Prophet ﷺ is clearly a vehicle for the Quran. The expressions that he gives in his Hadith are, are from him. So it's the language of, of the Quraysh. And you will find sayings of Sahaba that are similar to Hadith. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ was undoubtedly the most eloquent of the people that spoke Arabic. But the distinction between the Hadith and between the Quran is absolutely remarkable for anybody that ponders that. The, the, the Quran brought new ways. The Arabs had never heard anything like this. And this is not an exaggeration. This is simply a, a, a statement of fact. They had never heard anything like it. It's hard for us today, especially people that don't have access to the Arabic, to understand this. And also because the Arabs grow up with the Quran and they've heard it since they were children, they also don't understand the newness of the language. But they do recognize, even, even if they're not terribly educated, they do recognize that it has a, distinct, a distinctness that differs from other language. And, and in that way, it's, we can honestly say that it's, when they said this is not the words of a bashar, they, they were not exaggerating in saying that it's not the words of a human being because they had never heard anything like it. Things like, لا تزيروا وزرة وزرة أخرى that that is such a beautiful statement and yet if you said it uh, if somebody tried to say that in another way and this is something Bassam Sayyah points out and I thought it was a really nice uh, illustration of this point if you say for instance لا تحمل حامرتن حمرتن أخرى if somebody said that in a speech it, it, it would just people wouldn't they just wouldn't uh, it, would, it would seem ridiculous because when, when Allah says that, it, it just, there's something about that language that's so powerful that even Lebanese Christians or Palestinian Christians will study the Quran purely as a literary masterpiece and really appreciating the language of it. But if you try to speak in a Quranic language uh, and use the types of idioms that the Quran uses, uh, Nobody would take you seriously. And this is something very remarkable about the Qur'an. The fact that it is, it, it's so profoundly serious in its presentation and in its language, and yet uh, any attempt to use the types of idioms that the Qur'an uses would not work in normal human language. Um, so, so the language is, is fascinating and, and very difficult um, to... Uh, I mean, there is an argument that it's, it cannot be imitated, um, but there are some examples of, of lines that people try to, like, for instance, Musaylim um, al-Kadhab, he actually uh, tried to imitate some of the, the verses of the Qur'an, and he put it in the idioms of the Qur'an, so he used the type of structures that the Qur'an uses, but it ended up sounding ridiculous. And, and this is remarkable that uh, he could not replicate the Qur'an. And there's two different opinions about sarfa and ta'jiz. Did, did Allah remove the, uh, the possibility or is, are simply people incapable of it? Um, most of the scholars uh, inclined towards the that it's simply i'jaz, it's a mu'jizah in that way, that it prevents people from mimicking it. But the newness of the language to the Arabs 
was just stunning. And this is a good example. وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَدْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ That is clearly a Quranic statement. It does not sound like a hadith. It is clearly from the Quran. And this is the way the Quran speaks to us. It's, it's just a very interesting language. So it's, it's facilitated, the Quran, Allah has facilitated it in many ways, in its tilawa, in its remembrance, but also in its understanding that the Quran has a remarkably uh, sparse vocabulary. There's about 1,700 um, and, and 20 odd um, words uh, or, or in the root system of the Quran. So the triliteral or the quadriliteral literal uh, words in the Quran. There, there are not that many. Uh, you can learn Quranic vocabulary in a relatively short period of time. But the richness of the language, the nuance of the language, the nuance of the words and the semantic fields that the Quran creates are, are quite stunning. And that's why potentially there's a, just an immense amount of possibility for, uh, for meaning to, to emerge. The, the meanings of the Quran, لا تنقضي عجائبه the, 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 the wonders of the Quran will never cease. But also we've been facilitated to actually implement the Quran. And, and to practice the Qur'an. This is all uh, possible. And so people have to, in, in, in essence, empty their minds and really uh, to, to, to enter into the Qur'an. kafa. Enter into this silm. Enter into this state of submission, which is to submit to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, really set aside your preoccupations. Uh, one of the... The, the buzzwords that, that is used constantly today is mindfulness, this idea of mindfulness, of people being mindful. There was no human being who has ever existed on this planet that was more mindful than the Prophet And Prophetic mindfulness is a sunnah, the practice of mindfulness. The Prophet was mindful in every single human action that he, uh, that he participated in. He, when he got up, he had a prayer. When he first woke up, he, he immediately uh, remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he woke up, it was the first thing he said when he woke up. Subhana ladhi ahyani ba'dama amatini wa ilayhi nashur. Subhana ladhi ahyani ba'dama amatini wa adhina li fi dhikri. Allahumma ja'al fi qalbi nura, fi lisani nura, fi sam'i nura, fi basri nuri, fawqi nura, tahti nura, an, yami, an yamini nura, wa an shimali nura. Allahumma ja'al asabi nora, Allahumma ja'alni nora, Allahumma a'tini nora. I mean, this was a dua that he, he said every, every morning when he woke up, and then he would recite the ends of the last ayahs of uh, Surah Ali Imran, which is about looking into the heavens. So he would actually go outside, look up into the stars, and then recite these verses. And then when he put on his clothes, he was mindful. He always put on his sirwal, sitting down. When, when he went into, uh, when, when he went to relieve himself, he had a prayer. When he came out, he had a ghufranika, he had a prayer. When he ate, he had a prayer. When, when he, um, when he uh, finished his meal, he had a prayer. When he saw uh, people, he, assalamu alaikum, that's a prayer. When he left people, he had a prayer. When he started walking towards the masjid, he had a prayer. When he went into the souq, he had a prayer. When he bought something, he had a prayer. When, if he bought new clothes, he had a prayer for it. لبست جديدا وعشت حميدا ومت شهيدا. It's just stunning. The entire uh, life of the Prophet is a testimony to prophetic mindfulness, which is being in a state of presence. It's being present. It's being aware. And so the the Quran is is a book that brings you into the presence. In fact, one of the secrets of the uh, balagha of the Quran, which is in Arabic, is called iltifat, which which is it's 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 a technique you don't really find it much in in uh, I, I have I've rarely seen it in Western uh, literature. I have seen it uh, strangely enough in uh, in some of the poetry of. Uh, Dylan, who won the, the uh, Nobel Prize for Literature, he actually uses iltifat in, his, in some of his poetry. Uh, they walked along by the old canal, a little confused. I remember well. So when you talk in the third person, then you go to the first person. That's called iltifat. So if you look in the, in the, in the, in the, 
in, in Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins it, uh, if, according to Imam Shafi'i, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Imam Nafi' begins it, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, and the hadith in Sahih Muslim, uh, Sahih al-Bukhari begins it with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. But he begins, uh, if you begin it with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawmi Deen, Iyaka, that's iltifat, to move into the, going from the ghaib to the hadir, going from the third person to the first person, or the second person in this case. Iyaka na'budu. So it's going from a type of, as you enter into the prayer, you're moving into presence. And then you become present with Iyaka na'budu. So the Quran pulls you into a type of divine presence. If you read it with attentiveness, if you read it with mindfulness, if you read it with presence. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرْ You know, are you going to really take this, uh, this, 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 uh, this word and, 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 and make it part of your, of your very being? Uh, and obviously, memorization is one of the best ways to actually bring it into your very, it, I mean, it becomes all of your s synaptic connections in your own brain uh, become uh, uh, enlightened with the, the, the memory of the Quran. So if you, if you recite a, a verse from memory, that means that it's lodged in, in your consciousness, in your mind. So this is what we're being told to do to really reflect deeply, to take this upon ourselves, uh, to, to enter into this uh, extraordinary gift that we have been given. This is called the, uh, the ma'dubatullah. The, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has invited us to the banquet and the Quran is his banquet. And ma'daba is, is in, the, in one riwayah, it's ma'duba, which is a banquet. Now there's ma'daba, which is the place where you're disciplined, where your soul is disciplined. And so the Quran is essentially teaching us how to respond and how to react uh, to the world. And, and that's what's really important because if you look at, at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا That a person has had success who there's a difference of opinion about the verse is it god zakaha or is it the person actually willfully and i think both of them are are sound meanings because you can't do anything except allah wills it first and so this is uh, completely compatible but that zakaha that he has had success the one who allah has caused his soul to grow. Zakkaha, tazkiya. وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّهَا And he has failed, the one who failed to, uh, or, or, or who allowed his soul to be stunted. So the growth of the soul, uh, the, so one theologian said that you have to think of God more as a gardener than a mechanic. That, that, uh, and this is uh, obviously metaphorical. Uh, you have to you have to think of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala as one who nurtures you. That's why Rabb al Alameen is the Murabbi. Allah is the one you Rabbi al Alameen. He's the one that nurtures the world, that causes them to grow. And so, the way Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, it's not like a mechanic who just is going to fix your problems. No, this is this is done through nurturing. So two things are happening. One is that you're born with all these default settings as a human being. You come into the world with all these default settings. So one of the default settings is that you, you, you're selfish. This is a default setting. So one of the things we have to teach children is to share. We had, out of the five children that, that, that I had, um, we had one that just naturally shared, but the other ones had to learn that. And we know in the story of Hatim al Ta'i, who was the most generous of the pre-Islamic Arabs, his, uh, he had a tent uh, that he lived in, but then he had a tent for hospitality. So anybody that came to him, he would, they could stay in the tent as long as he wanted, and he would feed them and take care of them. In fact, it's said that once he had a beautiful falcon, 
and and he, he had a guest come and he didn't have anything to serve him so he ended up sacrificing the falcon which was worth a lot and 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 feeding the man the falcon and then when, when he asked the man you know did did he need anything he said he came to buy his fa his famous falcon and he had just fed him the falcon but there are many stories about hatam al but it said that his his brother wanted to because everybody praised hatam for being so generous in fact the arabs say ajwadu man hatam more generous than hatam al -tai. and so the uh, the his brother set up a tent of uh, hospitality and his mother visited him and when she saw the tent she said what are you doing and he said, oh, I, I want, because Hatim has a tent for hospitality, I want to have a tent for us. And she said, don't waste your time. And he said, why? And he said, when I suckled you, you used to put Hatim, push Hatim away. And when I suckled Hatim, he would pull you to uh, my other breast. <laughs> in other words, this was fitrah in him. So you do find those people, but I don't think she was fair to him because I think people can work on themselves and get better at it. So, and that's, that's the important point, is that we have to nurture our souls out of the, these default settings. Uh, and so uh, cowardice, a lot of people are afraid, but you can overcome your fears. It, it, takes, it takes work. Uh, and, and in fact, one of the most courageous spiritual acts that you can do is to live joyfully, because it's very easy to be depressed. That's easy. Anybody can be depressed. I mean, you look at the world. The, what? The world doesn't make you depressed? If it doesn't, you're, you're dead. You have no heart. But it takes courage to, to live joyfully despite that, despite everything in the world. In fact, a, a, a very wise philosopher who was a, a teacher of my father once said that, um, he said that uh, he was asked, can, a, can a, um, a person be happy knowing all the things wrong with the world? And he said, oh, indeed. The, the truly happy person is happy in spite of everything he knows about the world. And, and part of the reason why he's happy is because he, he feels an obligation to be happy. Because one of the reasons why the world is such an unhappy place is there's so many unhappy people in it. And so why would you want to contribute to the unhappiness of the world. And we all know to be around people that are joyful, it has an effect on us. I mean, that, one of the reasons, like people at, at, at Zaytuna, everybody missed Imam Zaid, because Imam Zaid, when he comes around people, he has a joyful presence. And so people always feel joyful around. He makes me feel joyful. And, and that's a gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him, but it's also something that we can work on in our own selves. Some people have it naturally. His personality is sanguine, and it's a, it's, it's a, it's a beautiful uh, temperament to have. But you can work on that in yourself to not be a downer, to not be the wet towel, to not be the person that people walk away feeling relieved that they're out of your company. Uh, so that's, that's very important. So. It's, it's a courageous act to be joyful in an incredibly depressing world because you're bringing joy to a place that needs more joy. I mean, that's, that's just something really important. So, so one of the things that the Qur'an teaches us, and I think this is really, really fundamental to the Qur'anic teaching, it teaches us how to respond appropriately in order for us to grow spiritually, in order for there to be taskiyah of the self, in order for the self not to be stunted. And one of the greatest gifts uh, that our, our masters have given us is the teaching of Abu Abbas al-Mursi. Uh, uh, and everybody in Egypt knows Abu Abbas al-Mursi. Uh, his, his maqam is in Alexandria. And, and I actually witnessed uh, a, a clear uh, miracle in that place. And Sheikh Nabil Mahfouz was with me as a witness. But uh, it, he was an extraordinary spiritual master. And he was the teacher of uh, Ibn Atayla, the great uh, scholar who wrote the Hikam al Ataiya. But Ibn Atayla, who was a, a, a quite accomplished uh, jurist, faqih, an alim, and, and well known, he wasn't 
just a mystic, but he, he really was an accomplished scholar. He was feeling the weightiness of the world on, on his shoulders. And, and, and sometimes we, we have that experience. And he went to visit Abu Abbas uh, at Mursi. And when he came in, he told him there are only four states in the world. There's only four states. And there's only four responses to each one of those states. And this is purely Quranic. So he said, uh, and he put it, some of them have, have versified it. He said, Al-Abdu fi ni'matan aw bariyatan yakunu aw ta'atan aw ma'asiyatan. So Al-Abdu fi ni'matan aw bariyati yakunu aw ta'atan aw ma'asiyati. A, 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 a servant is either in blessing or tribulation. So those are, those are two, two states. You're either in blessing or you're in tribulation. Or, or you're in obedience or disobedience. So those are the four states. You cannot, it's, it's like a Boolean algebraic, uh, uh, it's like a Boolean algebraic um, presentation. Like he's exhausted the states of the world. So, so here you are, the four states. الأحوال أربع مدى الليالي. So the, the أحوال of this world are four as long as time exists. It's one of these four. ومقتد الحق بذي الأحوال. And what الحق necessitates, the truth demands in each one of these four states are the appropriate responses. أن يشكر الله to be grateful to Allah for the ni'ma. أن يشكر الله على ويصبر and to be patient for the tribulation. وليشهد المنة وليستغفر and to witness the blessings when, when you're in obedience to see the minna that this is the manan Allah, one of the names of Allah is Al-Mannan, the one, Yamunnu alayka, He reminds you of His blessings. So when you're in obedience is to see the minna, the, the tawfiq, the success that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you to be in that state, waliyastaghfirah, and to be in a state of repentance, of tawbah, uh, of istighfar, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiveness when you're in disobedience. Those are the appropriate responses. So somebody was telling me the other day, about he was in a uh, living with some Muslims and he felt like he was an outsider and, and they were mistreating him and he didn't feel comfortable. And, and I told him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, We made some of you a tribulation for others. Atasbirun, will you show patience? Will you show patience? And Allah sees all things. So whenever you're in a situation, the default setting is to think the worst of people. The way you, husn al one is actually difficult because it's not the default setting. The default setting is always to go to the worst of people. So somebody could be having a bad day and you come in and they, and they mistreat you and you think they were mistreating you because you had a turban on or you were a Muslim. Now that could very well be the case. They could have been a racist or they could have not like, but they could have just been having a bad day. You... It's your inward state that's going to determine how you respond to those circumstances. And the Quran tells us, أحسن, Return a wrong with a right. Return a wrong with a right. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. So the Quran is giving us all of the means by which the circumstances that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends to us. Because all of this is from God. And if you think it's from other than God... You, 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 you don't understand the creed of the Muslims. Everything is from God. All of the tribulations in your life are from God. In fact, according to Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, all of the diseases of the heart revolve around Adam al-Rida bi qadrillah, being discontent with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this does not negate free will, but we believe in, 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 in an extraordinary paradox of determinism and free will. That everything is decreed and yet Allah has made us free within that decree. But when things happen, you cannot escape your destiny. If you were destined to be uh, 
to die in a place, Allah will bring all the circumstances about to bring you to that place at that time that you were destined to be there. And there's no way that you can do that. I mean, I'll tell you a really interesting story that happened to me when I was in Saudi Arabia. Right after 9-11, I had gone, I was in, uh, I was in Jeddah. You know, I had just arrived from the airport. And, uh, and then I was at the airport. They have these drivers that drive you uh, because I was picked up at the plane, and then they drive you to, so there was a, this man, he was from one of the Bedouin uh, tribes, you know, they have these tribes, the Mu'adic, Beni Mu'adic, and, and uh, the Utban, and the uh, different, the Beni Harub, you know, the Har, Harbi people, and, and they're, I really liked them, I've always enjoyed co- co- conversing with them, but he asked me, this was right after 9-11, and he said to me, can I ask you a question, he asked me where I was from, I said America, he said, can I ask you a question, he said, sure. He said, why do the Americans hate us? Which made me laugh. I said, actually, you know, I think <laughs> they think that you hate them. He said, no, 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 I don't. He said, I don't hate Americans. I like Americans. And he said, why do they hate us? And I said, well, I think some of them, the ones that do maybe, is because they think that most of the hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. So they think somehow Saudis did this to them. And, he's, and then he asked me a really interesting question. He said, do they know anything about Qadr? And I said, I think most people there would deny the Qadr unless they're Amish. And uh, I didn't say that, but uh, I said, just said most people would deny the Qadr. And then he said, no, no, no. You, he said, لازم تعلمهم عن القدر. You have to teach them about the Qadr because he said it will remove hatred from their hearts. In other words, when you see that things are from Allah, you're able to live in this world in a completely different way where you don't have that kind of animosity towards people. Uh, and this does not negate, like, that there's loom, there is oppression, there's all these things in the world, but they're there as a test. And so it's not that you don't oppose oppression and try to remove oppression. You do, but you do it with that deep knowledge that... This is, these are the circumstances that God has given me to see how I behave. And then it enables you to turn your enemies into your friends because you don't hate them. You see them as vehicles of the divine and, and the good and the bad and the ugly and the beautiful, all these things. So this is, this is a time to get back to the Quran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, bring us back to the Quran and make us people of the Quran. Alhamdulillah, may you have a blessed month, inshallah. I hope you, you, some of you will uh, join me in the Jawahar uh, al-Quran if Allah gives me the ability, inshallah. And then again, I just really uh, please pray for um, our brother, Imam Suhaib Sultan. He, he, he was a really genuine gift to the community. Well, anybody who knew him knew knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, may Allah make it easy for his family and may Allah give him a high maqam in, uh, in Jannat al-Firdaus, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.